Hi, this is Now on Facebook Live and RadioBuzz.com, this is George Hutchinson, the Stone Age Man. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, this is George Hutchinson, the Stone Age Man, tamer of wild beasts. Welcome, everybody. I appreciate you listening to me. All my friends on Facebook. Well, today we've got an exciting show, I think. We're going to have George Schreiber, the Bushmaster. He is a tough fuel driver. He had the Yellow Fang race car. He drove uh, fuel alters like me. And he drove a car that I wanted to drive, jet cars. Now, uh, I'm going to talk for probably 10 minutes, uh, 5 minutes, and then have 10 minutes of call-ins. And the other 15 minutes is going to be for going to be for George Schreiber because he's in he's a very interesting man. George, I thought you quit this program. Well, I did quit the program, but but Joe and Chris, like in the movie The Godfather, gave me a gave me a, a gave me an offer I couldn't I couldn't re, I couldn't uh, forget or I couldn't turn down. <laughs> so, there's some things I would like to say before we get to the phone calls. You know, I didn't drive alone. I had some crew, but I had one important crew member. His name was John Vishan. He was a young fellow, about 15 years old, that really helped me immensely. He he was like a secretary when I would. Go talk to people. Go up in the tower. He come. I come back and he would say, "George, go for it." Okay, all right, I'll do that. I, 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 I know what you're talking about. I appreciate that. So, thank you, John. John Vishon. Now, there's other people that I would like to say hi to. Now, Kevin Scott is an awful good friend of mine. He lives in Arizona. He's a retired cop, and he's one of the nicest guys you ever want to meet. And Donald and Cindy Bannister are very close friends of mine. Now, they're close friends because they they keep me well fed. They send me little cars to get food once in a while, and I appreciate that very much. And the other one is Lori Chadwick, my niece, and she is a lookover. George, what's a lookover? Well, she looks over me. She takes good care of me. She sends me vitamins. She sends me things to keep me warm. And I appreciate all that kind of stuff. Now, Chris, don't we have some sponsors you want to talk about? Yes, we do. We would like to, uh, to thank Ray Racing for their support today for the show, as well as also we would like to thank Roy. That was Roy. I'm sorry. Roy, where did you go? Robinson. Robinson. There you go. Thank you. I'm so sorry. We got lost in the uh, all the sponsors here. Roy Ro- Robertson, Performance Drywall Services. He supported today as well as Bob Hopkins. He supported us. Thank you so much for all those folks out there and everyone else listening in and joining Ch- Georgia's show. All right. Now, on Facebook, like you guys know, there's a Bobby Fry of uh, Loud Pedal uh, Marketing Company. He tells me that he's got some T-shirts coming out of the Stone Age Man in a week or so. So kind of keep your eye on it, okay? Now, uh, Robert Borsch called in last week, and I got to apologize to you, Bob, because I didn't didn't quite hear your name, and I, I would like to have talked to you about about you and your dad and the things that he did. But if we get a chance down the road, I'd like to have you call back. And do we have any callers ready? No callers. No callers, huh? no callers yet. Okay, now next week, 
I'm going to have my nephew, Todd Hutchison. Now, he's a character like me. He's been, he's a photographer. He's been all over the world. He's, he, uh, he's taken, uh, he's taken photography for a lot of, a lot of great magazines. And he, and he's going to be very, uh, very interesting, I think, because he's got a lot of good, he's got a lot of good stories. All right, we have a call coming in. Okay. And you're live hey. with George Hutchinson, the Stone Age man. Hello. Hey, this is Mike Hayward. Yes, sir. Hey, my dad ran the Monkey Motion Fuel Altered. I saw you run a bunch of times at Irwindale in San Fernando when I was a little kid. And uh, let me tell you what, looking at that first rat trap with that flimsy chassis, <laughs> it was amazing that you were able to get it down this track. Well, you know, you know, Don was Don didn't have a lot of money, and he he did the best he could, you know that that he could. So when I start driving it, I took it to race car, especially where I was working, and I kind of tightened the frame up a little bit. Oh, okay, that's great. You remember my dad had the car with the number six on the door? Yes, I think so. Yes, yes. You know. I call fuel alter drivers the separators because that separates the men from the boys. You know, some guys say, oh, what? I say, hey, strap yourself into a fuel alter and go 200 miles an hour and tell me that's not a separator. You agree? Yeah. Especially those old ones with the 98-inch wheelbases. Oh, oh, I know. I know. Yes. It was fun. It was fun. Because you never knew what the car was going to do. You just never knew. You know, like I say, sometime, I, sometime I thought the car was trying to sightsee from going this way and that way, you know. Well, it was a thrilling deal. Yes, it was. Fuel altered. When the fuel altered lit and pushed down, everybody paid attention, you know. Well, didn't Willie Boris tell you not to drive that car? He gave you yes. like that you're oh, going to kill yes. yourself in it? Yes, yes. When he first saw me in the pits that first night, he said, George, what are you driving? I said, I'm driving. He said, George, it's going to kill you. I said, nah, nah. He said, mark my words. That car is going to kill you. Of course, you know, I don't think he really meant that, but he meant, George, that's a handful. Well, you know, when, when, when I was at Fernando and got my license, I said, <laughs> I, I, I said to Don, does it always do that? And he said, you haven't seen nothing yet. <laughs> didn't, didn't Harry, didn't uh, Harry Hibbler drove that thing once or twice, didn't he? I don't know. I, that I don't know. I, I've never heard that. I know that when I finished driving the U.S. Turbine 1, that he bought it or got it from Fling Trailer and took the turbine motor out of it and put a tough fuel in there. Now, I'm sure he and got Harry away. And drove that one. Yes, heavily drove that one, yes. Now, I never saw him because I was already left racing. But I, I can imagine with the top fuel motor and laying on your back like you have to, what a rush that must have been, you know. Yeah, I mean, uh, that was a lay-down driving deal, wasn't it? Oh God, yes! It was terrible. It was, it was, you know, you you lost your sense of direction because when you lay on your back, you know, you don't you don't you don't feel things very much. It's kind of a it you know, like like that like that film that's on YouTube of me at Fernando in the turbine car. You know, that's been watched fourteen thousand times, and every time I look at it, oh. Oh, I say, God, it, did like I it do was that. all over the track on that. You know, on, yeah, when I you see. got it down the track a couple times in that video, but there was a couple times when you, one time you got the cones. Oh yeah, I know that was, that was the beginning. I was trying to, you know, the car drove different every time, but I got to the point where I could feel what it was about to do. So the longer I drove it, the better I, the better I drove what it. What kind of? What kind of mile an hour were you doing on the top end? Well, I got, car? you know, depending on, 
on the track because I went to so many different tracks. In Arizona, because the track was so hot, I went 250 miles an hour. Now, some tracks I would do. That was in that car. That was amazing. Oh, (laughs) God. Tell me about it. Tell me about it. (laughs) <laughs> Tell me that story about the one where that you had the cameras on the car and something weird happened. I can't. Now you told me some story once about that, where that you had the cameras on the car to take pictures and yeah, something that, weird that, happened. Right at the PDA meet, I was making exhibition passes, and and the guy from Newsweek magazine put a camera up front, and we put a wire along the car and put the and put the uh, trigger on the steering wheel. He said, all you got to do, George, is just keep hitting the trigger, and it'll take pictures. Okay. So here it was, you know, 20,000 people here at Lions for the PDA meet. And when I lit the damn thing, you know, I concentrated on hitting the button. And what I do, my front wheel hit the guardrail just a little bit. And, of course, it, I shut it off, and Hibbler, I mean, uh, C.J. Hart, we checked the car over, and then I went back and I made a full pass. But that pulling the trigger, you know, made me go. <laughs> but I tell you, that turbine car made a believer out of you. Yeah. Um, I wonder if that car, if that chassis is still around somewhere. Uh, I really don't know. You know, You know, when I was driving those race cars, I was very, very well disciplined. I really disciplined myself because I used to write notes and I would go over it in my mind because, you know, it only takes one mistake. One mistake and you're dead. Did, but, you, did you tune Don Green's engine with, for the rat trap? And were you the tuner? Or? No, no, I just did drove you? it. Don, Don did the tuning. You know, Don, uh, Don loved that race car and he... Uh, was his baby, and I, I, I was just a driver. The only car I tuned was the turbine car. The Stone Age Man car, I had, you know, Doug Fisher. Remember Doug Fisher? I heard the name sounds familiar. Yeah, he had a balancing shop. He balanced crankshaft. He was an excellent... That was uh, your- yeah, he was an excellent tuner. He did a good job for me. He was very meticulous. What's the story about how you got Ed Pink's engine? I love that story. Well, ha, well, we got a couple of minutes, and I got George Schreiber coming on, so I'll try to make it quick. I was at Lions in my Stone Age Man car, and this young kid came by, and he was looking in the in the car, and I let him sit in there. And the next week I was there, he brought a bunch of other kids. And let them sit in there. I said, oh, good. That's, I don't mind. Let's get you involved. So one weekend, here comes Billy with a, with a man that I didn't recognize. And he walked over to me and said, George, this is my dad, Ed Pink. I said, what? He said, this is Ed Pink. And Ed Pink said, George, I want you to come to my shop because I understand you have a, a big race in Las Vegas. He said, I'm going to put one of my motors in your car oh 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 so only because i had his son who i didn't know who he was name was billy pink ed said i appreciate he's still around he's doing carburetors now who is bill pink is a carburetor guy is he i thought he was nascar yeah that's what he is he i think he does carburetors to me oh at nascar let me know chris Let me know when George calls in, okay? Okay, George, nice talking to you. Hey, the same. I appreciate you calling in. All right, take care. Have a good one. You're welcome. Is George on the line? No. We got another one. We got more, huh? Now, let me let me tell you, a friend of mine called in, called me on the phone a couple of days ago, said, George, his, his name is Ed Hill. He lives in Pattaya, Thailand. When I go vacation, I go see Ed because he's a good guy. He's one of the good guys. Now, he called me and said, George, he said, I watch your tel- your television show. I said, what? Where are you in America? He said, no, I'm in Thailand. I said, how the heck did you? He said, George, 
Remember, it's a world wide web. You know, I never realized, I never, I never visioned. I, when I talk like this, I think there are just a couple out there. I don't realize that it's all over the world. You know, so I was kind of, I was kind of shocked by that. And there was some lady in Ling, in, in London that wrote night things about me. I, you know, those kind of things, uh, you know, when they're, when you've got so many people, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't see that. I think I'm talking to some friends, you know. Now, uh, what else am I going? Oh, yeah, let me talk about, you know, when, when people come to the races, they always want to, they focus their attention to drivers. They're always the drivers. They don't, they don't pay attention to the crew or the, or the mechanic or the engine man. It's the driver. And that's really not, if it weren't for the crew and if it weren't for like John Bichon for all the, for all the things that happen, you know, I, I, I was jarred. I was jarred a couple times to see how the fans look at you. I had no idea that fans looked at us drivers like they do. I was in a, you know, I lived in Van Nuys. George hadn't called in yet. Uh, I lived in Van Nuys, California. And that's where the, really the hub of racing is, is in Van Nuys, California. And I was in a, I was in a, parts house and there was two young boys buying parts and I was standing waiting for my turn and another young man came in and said you guys going to drag tonight they said yeah he said Hutchison's going to be there the stone age man now here I am stand behind them they don't know who I am they don't know I'm the stone age man but they were talking about oh he does that and oh he does this you know, he's that. I tapped one on the shoulder. I said, hey, would you recognize the Stone Age man if you looked at him? They said, no. I said, well, I'm the Stone Age man. What? What? They said I had to get my wallet out and show my ID to show me who they were. So, you know, I had no idea that that much of attention, excitement, and 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 watch went on. Now, one time I was at Lions in the Stone Age Man car, and something happened at the the big end. I don't remember if my parachute didn't come out, or I I, I never caught fire at Lions. I caught fire once at Irwindale. But anyway, the announcer was yappity yap about Hutchins and being all, being at the end of the track. They sent an ambulance down there, and and uh, we were we were you know discussing it wasn't so bad, and here this 13, 14 year old kid ran up to me, hugged me, and said, "George, are you okay?" Now I didn't know that kid. I had no idea who it was, but the idea was he knew my history. He knew me. He cared about me. To run down that track to where the end of the track was and see for himself that I'm okay, I never forgot that. I just never forgot that. That's what got me. When I drove the turbine car, why, I used to go and buy red jackets, a nice, beautiful jacket that said crew member on it. I bought six or seven of them. And before I would, uh, you know, that before I make passes, why well, I would go up in the tower and say, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to pick some young man out of the stands and I'm going to make him part of my crew for the rest of the day. And I'm going to give him a jacket. So, you know, when we were young, <laughs> When we were young, we all put a towel over our back and tied it in the front and pretended we were Superman. We all did that. 
So, so those kids that watch us as drivers, you know, they're doing the same thing. They go home and go, hum, uh, hum. you know, when I had my top fuel car at Larry Dixon's garage, Larry Dixon Jr., little Larry, used to sit in my top fuel car and go, rum, rum. I remember that. And when I saw him when he was older, ah, I don't remember that. He didn't want to admit that he, you know. So anyway, back to the story. I would get up in the announcer and I'd tell people, I want some young man to be part of my crew for the rest of the day. Now, there was hand. I said, raise your hand. Let me know what you want to do. It. Come to the fence and I'll pick somebody out. You know, it was because of those guys at the port, at the parts house, and that young man that came by that I realized, George, there's a lot of people like you and follow you and and care for you in their heart. They really, they really uh, are attached to you. So I would take this jacket and I would go down to the fence. And I'd look at all the kids, you know, around 12, 13, 14 years old, you know, or something like that. And they were all raising. I told them, raise your hand. So I would look for the kid that was sitting next to his mom and did this, thinking this guy's never going to pick me. Ah! Well, that's, you know, that's the one I pick. I go, you. What, me? Yes, you. Come on down. So I bring him down, I give him the jacket, have him come around and spend the day with me. Now, what do you think that that young man, as he grew up, do you think he might want to drive a race car? <laughs> you know, and the other thing, nobody's calling in yet. What's the matter? You don't, you don't like me, folks? Huh? You don't like me anymore? Anyway. I used to give I used to give quarters out. When I would go to Chrysler Agency with the turbine car or my Stone Age Man car, I would get on the local radio and invite fathers to bring their sons. The father can look at the new Chryslers and the son can come over and talk to me. Okay? So when they were there, you know, a twelve year old boy has got an imagination like that. You know, he's got a Wild imagination. So, when David Cook, come on, I let him sit in the car, and I'd say, you see this quarter? I said, this quarter went 200 miles an hour. What? They'd say, what? I said, this quarter went 200 miles an hour. And I would give the, you know, you could see that that young man went, wow, this quarter went 200 miles an hour. So, that, when I quit racing, and the years later, not too many years later, I was at J.C. Penney's. And I walked up to the counter. I was buying some cologne or something. This young man, about 18, 19, 20, something like, like that, kind of looked at me and he said, Are you George Hutchison? I said, Yes. He said, When I was a kid, you gave me one of those quarters. Now, tell me. You tell me that that didn't leave an impression that that he recognized me to to tell me that you know I uh, those kind of things are the thing that warmed my heart that uh, that that I wasn't just a I wasn't just a driver that wanted wanted to win races. I don't know what happened to George. I'm going to have to. All right, we got a call on the line, George. All right, go ahead. You're live with George Hutchinson, the Stone Age man. Uh, hi, how you doing? Fine. Who is this? This is this is Marty. Marty, do I know you from the Facebook? Uh, yep, I'm on there with Facebook with you. I I called. The reason I called was because I wanted to I wanted to ask you about um what your personal life was like uh, going from track to track uh, all year long, every year, yeah. and, and how it, how it, what it was like for you. Well, 
it was kind of it was kind of tough because you know when you're when you're at the races you you learn to like to eat hot dogs <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know you, you learn to like hot dogs but traveling was you know i would call up and i had a i had a, the turbine car is the one that i did most of my traveling you know and i would go to the local town where the racetrack was, I'd get on the local radio and I'd talk to the people, tell them little stories and and all this and all that. Some of the tracks were little, but they drew a lot of people. So of a lot of time, not all the time, a lot of times I'd hear on my door, what? they say, can I have your autograph? The word got out I was in town and oh, oh, the people would bring things and I'd sign it and I have to put a sign on the door after 10, 11 o'clock. Hey, I'm going to bed. So, you know, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was a tough life. It was a, I had a flat tire once on the, on the trailer of the turbine car. And that was a nightmare all by myself, you know, but, uh, really? I, I enjoyed when I would go to, to the local town, and get on the local radio. It was kind of nice to see people come up to me and uh, ask me the thousands of questions that they always did. And you know, in the winter time, come home, I came, home, I came. But it was tough. But uh, uh, but knowing that you got fans out there that are looking forward to see you, you know, that does something to you. It gives you a little more. Yeah. Uh, Yes, it gives you a little more energy, you know. But it becomes part of your life. It becomes, you know, part of who you are. That's right. Exactly. That's part of your life. Right. You know, living on, yeah. living in Van Nuys like I did every Friday night was cruise night. All the kids yeah. cruise, cruise the boulevard. And, of course, I would sometime get my Stone Age my car in the trailer and drive it up and down Van Nuys Boulevard. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. And, and, I thought that was a show. Yeah, and there was a parking lot that was empty that I would pull in there and here's, here, I'll hear all the kids come, you know. What do they do? They got to show me their car. George, would you come look at my car? Of course, you know, when you're young and that you've got a, you've got your, your, 56 Chevy or whatever to you. It's the best looking car on the road. And it is mm -hmm. each one of them loved their car and thought that they're, so I would always, wow. Can I sit in your car? I would sit in the car and say, wow, this is a nice car. That's what they wanted to hear. And I was uh -huh. tickled pink, tickled pink that I could, uh, you know, uh, cause I was a stone age man. I was, Almost walked on water. Not quite, you know. <laughs> 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 so I, well, uh, I tell you, um, yeah, you I know, watching uh, watching the races and watching uh, you with your image, with your your plumage of your helmet, and and the showmanship and everything was was just always something amazing to look forward to. Well, you know, like I've told people, I didn't win a lot of races, but everybody knew who I was. Yeah. I took my race yeah. car inside Silmar Juvenile Hall and talked to the kids. Wow. I took my race car into high schools when they had a show, when they had a car show. I'd take my race car and talk to everybody. You know, the main thing, you know, Going to the uh, CMR Juvenile Hall touched my heart. You know, I talked to those yeah. young men. I said, you know, I said, you think that you're the end of the world just hit you. You're sitting in here. When I was your age, I sat in the same chairs as you. I grew up without a father. I got loose and my mom, she, she wasn't that smart to uh, to keep check on me and I got in some trouble, nothing minor, but I got in trouble. So I know what you're thinking about. I usually tell them, you know, folks, if if 
you don't have faith in yourself, how do you expect anybody else to? You know, you got to look in the mirror when you get up and say, I love you. You're out of you're you're outstanding. There's nothing you can do. You got to tell yourself that. If you don't, you can't wait till somebody tells you that. You're your biggest exactly. cheerleader. You're your biggest cheerleader and you're your biggest sep- skeptic too. So always remember yeah. to love yourself. So I I enjoyed being the stone age man. I really did. I saw myself <laughs> Don't laugh, folks. I saw myself as a Lone Ranger. Because when I was a kid growing up, he was my hero. I used to listen, turn the radio on, listen to the mighty high old silver, the Lone Ranger. Of course, you know, I bought the guns and I bought the hat. And I pretended when I was a kid that I was a Lone Ranger. Mm -hmm. So I kind of, I kind of. You know, I I saw myself as a Lone Ranger. And what did the Lone Ranger do? He stood for what's good. He always tried to help people. And that's why the fans meant so much to me. Because remember, yeah. I'm I'm the Lone Ranger. I can't do bad. I got to do good all the time. You know, some guy wrote me last week and said, George, you were always cool. And you were a sharp dresser. Why? I did that. I wore white pants. I took two pair of white pants in case they got dirty. Clean shirts. Because I wanted to look the part. I'm the Stone Age man. I can't walk around with dirt on my shirt or dirt on my pants. I I got an image I have to keep. So, you know, I'm sorry that I walked away from it. But at the time, you know, my original intention was to get my top fuel license and flash it. Get my license and then say, that's it, I'll do something else. And say, oh, yeah, I did, I did that. Here's my license. But you get hooked. You know, it's like a drug. You drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you drink the cool well, you've, come a long, you've come a long way since then, you know, and, and you still are the Stone Age man. You know? Well, I I appreciate that, sir. You know, I, I when I was driving, I was very disciplined. Because you can say now I'm not that disciplined. I just, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a character. I've got a funny bone in me. I laugh at things you shouldn't laugh at. But I love myself. Mm-hmm. I'm proud of myself. You know, I just, uh, I look back, I wish I'd have got married. I wish I'd have had a son. But those are wishes. I chose a life. You know, I flew in the Civil Air Patrol. I had my own airplane. I flew all over the country. You know, that, oh. that, uh, that uh, adventureness that I had that when I was driving, it didn't go away. You know, it's still there. Yeah. It, 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 the life that you lived is the life that you were meant to live. Say again? The life that you lived is the life that you were meant to live. Yeah, yeah. I know. So you talking about missing out on something. You haven't missed out on anything. You're... you're, you're you're look at you. You're you're on the show. You're having a good time. You've been places. You've done things that other people only dreamed of. Well, you know, what what tells me I was meant to be the Stone Age man. You know, I had a dream and saw this helmet in a dream. The same mm-hmm. plumes on it. The Roman thing. I saw that in a dream. Now, where did that come from? Where'd that come from? So I got up that morning, I sketched it, and I got balsa wood and uh, resin. I made, I formed it myself until that mind's eye view I had in that dream. I said, that's it. That's it. You know, in in, uh, Bill Carter or Frank Hedge, when I used that motor, the Stone Age motor, when Bill Carter said, what are we going to name the race car? So I've got, 
who's on the call, George? So uh, we lost those, that call. all those things, like you said, I I was meant to be the Stone Age man. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Well, I appreciate. Yes, you know, uh, it it warms my heart when I when people talk to me on Facebook and say, "I remember this," and "I remember that," and and you know, you touched me. Well, that's what I wanted to do. I was I grew up without a fa- without a father, and I had no direction in life. If you want to say that, a a policeman. A police, I got in trouble in the Leo Rep. When I became a reserve policeman, why Leo Rep was the officer I rode with. Well, he was the one that come to my house and made sure I was on, that I was doing the good things. A policeman come around to my house and saw to it that I was towing the line. Now, when I got old enough and became a reserve policeman, I couldn't wait. To ride with my buddy, Leo Rep, because he he was like a father to me. He was like a, I looked up to him, and he was a, he was a terrific policeman. He was the kindest. You know, when you go to a situation where a lot of arguing going on, why well, he calm them down and say, "Don't worry, it's it's okay. Don't worry about it." So we have another call coming in. Let's take this call. Hey, what's happening? Hey, it's Joe Wall on the line. What's up, George? Hey, Joe, how you doing? <laughs> I've been listening to your stories, brother. I'm so glad that you uh, decided to stick with it. And I'm sure all the listeners today are really, really stoked because they saw you got tons of people watching the show today, brother. So I'm proud well, of you. Well, good. You know, I think there's maybe two people out there, I think. You know, <laughs> 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 yeah, when, you, when you're sit when you're sitting in the room by yourself like me and Chris do, we're all alone. <laughs> That's it. There ain't nobody out there. That's but right. There's nobody out there. Is right. We're all listening. Now, how yeah, come we're watching you, buddy? Good. Now, how come George Schreiber didn't call in? I gave him the number. Uh, maybe he's been trying to call, and we're all talking. So, I just wanted to tell you, brother, I was listening. I'm glad you're sticking with it, man. Your show's going to be kick-ass, brother. Why, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. I'll lo- I just wanted to say hello, brother, and uh, you're doing a hell of a job, George. Why, thank you, sir. Thank you. I'm just an old man, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're all old, buddy. We're all getting old, so it doesn't matter. All those hey. guys out there listening, share it with your friend. Tell them the Stone Age man is back. I know they're doing a T-shirt for you. I saw that those guys are making a T-shirt, the Stone Age Band. So I yeah. to make sure that we get some T-shirts. Yeah. Bob Fry is supposed to be making T-shirts for me, he said. Of course, I haven't seen him yet, but if he says he'll do it, he'll do it. Oh, yeah, Bobby Fry. I, I talked to him about it a couple of weeks ago. He, got, he goes, like, oh, he's on our show. So we got to make sure we get some of the Stone Age Band shirts, so. Tell everybody out there the Stone Age Man T-shirts are coming, man. We got to get them. Sell some T-shirts for the man. <laughs> that's it. That's it. That's it. Hey, we're making money for you, buddy. All right. All right. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Well, I just wanted to call and tell you we love you, brother, and you're doing a hell of a job. And everybody out there, share this uh, uh, show with them, so that way George can. Become world famous one more time, everybody. Ah. Give him a round of applause. Tell him how much you love him and call in and tell him. Well, I appreciate it, Joe. If it weren't for you, I'd never have this show, and I appreciate that. Believe me. Uh, Don't you worry about me, buddy. You uh, just do what you do and have fun at it, man. And I'm glad that you're part of our family. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I'll, so I'll you, stop interrupting and let you go on. I'm, I'm almost to my destination anyway, but you have okay. a great show, brother, and I'll talk to you soon. All right. Take care. Take care. You got it. The Stone Age Man, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> See you, brother. Okay, okay. No more. No callers, huh? 
All right. We have no more, no other callers at the moment, but we can well, take another call. Uh, if you get another call. I will let you know, George. Okay. Well, now what else should I talk about? Let me think here. Let me think. Let me think. Let me think. Uh, all right. I'll tell you. I'll tell you the story. How the turbine caught fire. You say, what? Did it <laughs> caught fire? I said, yeah, it did. At San Fernando. Why the turbine had a, a housing that the combustion chamber was and the fuel lines were alongside of it. Well, from the vibration over the years or over the months, one of the fuel lines leaned against that housing and burned through to the fuel. Of course, I had already shut the motor off. I think it when I was coaching to go off the track, and the fuel, the, the fuel got on the got on the housing, and and fumes and smoke came out of the car. So when I when I got out of the car, the ambulance came so far, and it's is it George Schreiber? Let's see. Who do we have on the line live with George Hutchinson, the Stone Age man? Hey, George, it's Roy Robertson, Great Fine, Texas, USA. Hey, I Roy. Am a, I am a big fan of yours. Oh, you're kidding me. <laughs> oh, yeah, you got you got fans worldwide. You said that earlier today. Well, I just have to be in a different part of the USA. You're my sponsor, right? Well, I'm just I'm just one of those guys that loves you. How's that? Well, I appreciate that. You, you can't be very yeah, old, you know. You so, don't sound very old. So, so I started going to the drag races when I was like eight or nine years old. I walked around at US Thirty Drag Strip in Indiana, Gary, Indiana. They called it, but it was you know one of the outside towns with a with a Kodak One Ten when it was black box with the viewfinder on the top. And I was walking around when I was a little kid taking pictures. And that's what I did all the time. When I would go to drag ship, my dad and I go to drag ship. He'd let me go because he trusted the people that were there because wow. you know how family are at, at the drag races. So I saw the fuel cars get pushed by, you know, by, by the station wagons or whatever it was way back then. I saw Perdone getting pushed down down the track from the other end with uh, with the safari station wagon. I saw the rollers starting the cars later on, and then I saw the the, the starters off of the off of the the blower noses. So you know, I've seen a lot of stuff, and the old stories of people like you, I remember and. Believe me, you've made an impact on so many people you don't even realize. Wow, wow. You know, I, 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 sometime I sit here with the, everything turned off and I, I try to bring back what I did in the stories. You know, I try to bring it back. Sure. You, you know, when I look at that film of me on YouTube driving the turbine car, I still can't believe that's me in there. <laughs> I still can't believe that's yeah. me in there because it's, uh, well, I, I know, I know the, uh, the stamina it took to strap in that car and take a chance to step on that throttle because you never knew what it was going to do. And I always had to well, kind of, how fast, yeah. how it fast went, did that car go? It went 250 in Arizona. Other places it would okay. go 220, 210, 230. It, Depends on the track. You know, when right. I when I stepped on that throttle, it got to seventy two thousand RPM in seven tenths of a second. So you can imagine the wheels <laughs> snap. <laughs> it just these horses, was, right, buddy? Yeah, I was kind of like on ice. I was kind of like on ice because yeah. it it didn't catch up to the track until about three quarters of the way down there. I could feel it kind of settling into the track. That's what made that car. 
you know, so yeah. difficult. You know, and you couldn't, yeah. you couldn't, you couldn't lift your foot. Could just shut the motor off, shut the motor off. Mm -hmm. Take the cowling off and push a reset button. So I had to stay with it because sometimes I was getting paid a thousand dollars. I couldn't say, "Ah, oh, well, I got a little squirrely, folks," and I had to shut it off. You didn't get paid to shut it off, you know. So yeah, it was, yeah, no, it's yeah, that's 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 too good. It's all about the show back then. That's right. So that back then, go, growing up, going to the drag strip back then in the '60s. And the early 70s was a completely different experience that anybody even realizes. Oh, I, I know. I have friends at Drag Race now, and they've only been doing it like five, six years. And I start talking about, you know, about the things that are more recent than, than you, and they had no clue. And you start telling them all the stories, and they're going, you got to be kidding me. I go, oh, no. It was, it was about the show. You know, and you, you get the match races and, you know. Yeah, right. And. You get the funny cars out there, and it's like US 30 drag strip. They would, they, you know, there were circuits, and, and all those guys would go on match racing, and, and you'd have 16 car field, or, or you maybe you'd have, maybe you'd have a couple just show up. But some of those where they had the couple or four cars, and people don't realize this, but way back then, they used to take, and the loser tow car would get burned. They would have a big deal about burning the, the loser's tow car back in a seat. Wow. This was at 30. I don't know about other places. But, you know, and then they'd, they'd fake the fights at the starting line between racers. You remember those days? And, yeah. And it was all, yeah. the car would just go crazy. It was about the show. Now they've lost the aspect of what the show really was back then. And That's right. It's, it's, all, it's all money. It's all money. They got two or three spare yeah. motors. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and it was that I'm so glad to see the nostalgia stuff come back. And it's it's rekindled my interest in it all and so many others. And it's grown. It's just like the March meet this year. We we flew out there to the March meet this year. And it was, you know, the 60th anniversary. We went last year. I'd never been. I read about it all my life. And I, I literally learned how to take and read from car magazines and national dragster and what wow. I couldn't read, my mom would read to me and wow. that's how I grew up in this stuff. So, wow. so understanding and appreciating what all of you have done really goes to heart with me. And I just want to let you know that. All right, sir. I appreciate that. You warm my heart. You warm my heart. Well, you, you know, when I was, when I was driving the rat trap, that was a showstopper. You know, we pushed down, yep. we both lit and turned around and, and rut, rut, you rut the motor. You move a little bit. You <laughs> go, rut, yep. rut, he loom a little bit. And then rut, rut, I move a little bit. Rut and rut, rut. <laughs> you know, the people were going crazy. People were going crazy, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, it was so much fun. And that's, that's, that's why I appreciate you. I mean, it's, it's, you know, going back to the show, it's like when I first went to the direction, the very first time we were on the, I remember that we were on the, on the spectator side and it was double A gas cars of Stonewoods and Cook. It was Junior Thompson, John Masmania, and all those guys. So and that you was never my saw first me one. Drive, I was right? really a baby. So you never saw me drive, right? No, no, I didn't, but I've read about you. Oh, okay. I mean, Was it like good? I said, I, 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 I grew <laughs> up about in it, reading it, and I read about you. And that's wow. why it's so valuable for me to be part of this. It's just great. Wow. I'm glad you are there, and I really, really want to see you continue on with this because you, you add a perspective that people don't even realize what it was like way back then. Yeah, it was. It was di uh, certainly a lot different than it was than it was now. You know, you look at those guys, oh, yeah. they don't care about the fans. They don't care about all they care. No. How quick did I go and did I win? That's not what yep. that's not what the fans come. They don't care how fast you go. They wanna they want to show. They want they want to <laughs> see that you're paying attention, that they're watching. No, you know, and it's like I was reading something today 
on Facebook. Facebook is the best thing that ever happened for nostalgia racing because all these people have these shows. They have these, I mean, not shows. They have these photos. They have these stories. And you, you, you get back into into the history. It's like Roger Roger Lee and his his recreating these these fuel dragsters from way back that when and you know there's so many people like that and it's just it's just going crazy and I really really I'm just so wrapped up in it because that's what I grew up in. Wow. And wow. that's again it, it just goes back to people like you and I really appreciate you. I just wanted to call in and tell you that. Well, and thank add you, a little sir. fuel to the fire. You know, my nephew Todd wrote a book about me called The Chronicle of the Stone Age Man. And if you want to buy one, you can go to backinthedaystore.com. It's only $20. And it's got every picture of me, my story, what cars I drove. Every once in a while, I get it out and I, no shit, did I do all that? You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's back in the day store. I'll yeah, back in the day store. And it's a chronicle okay, of the Stone Age. Well, thank you, sir. Right, well, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to rub, I don't want to steal the airspace too much more. I just no, wanted to come you, on and tell you how much I appreciated it, and well, that's sure why you, I find Texas is supporting. You've touched you. my heart. You've touched my heart, and I thank yeah. you for. At my age, I need oh, that yeah. once in a while. All right, buddy. We'll look forward to the next one. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Oh, thank you. Love you, buddy. We'll see you later. Bye. Love you too, sir. Bye-bye. You want to stop it? Is that enough or what? Yeah, we're getting close to wrapping it up. We could take maybe one more call. Did you? You had George Schreiber. He was supposed to be calling in, right? Yes. I I don't know what happened. Oh, okay. Maybe he forgot. Maybe he forgot. So if anybody's out there, they uh, know George, give him a call. Text him, yell at him. Yeah, or we'll right. just make him feel guilty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I called him this morning and said, George. He said, All right, I'll do it. I said, He said, What time is your clock? So we time. I said, We got the same time. I don't know what happened. He's a good guy. He's a character like I am. All right. Well, we'll get. That last fellow that called in, thank you, sir, so much. You know how much that that means to me. You know, you never realize what people, you know, you don't see yourself like other people see you. You just don't. You see yourself differently than than you folks do. And I, I appreciate that. I really do. I, I, uh, you probably extended my life a couple months by that, you know. <laughs> no more calls. We should call no it. No more calls. We should All right. call it a night. Okay. All right, George. We're gonna call it a night. Thank you, everyone, for listening to the George Hutchinson Stone Age Man Show. Did you Remember, have something else you wanted to close? Yeah. Thank you, folks, for listening to me. God bless you for listening to me, and don't forget, God bless this greatest nation on earth. The United States of America. Good night. George Hutchinson, the Stone Age Man. Join us next week at 6, 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time right here on Facebook Live and syndicated on RadioBuzz.com. Goodbye. Goodbye.